Hello, I'm here today with Dr. Abraham Weisfeld, co-founder of the Alliance of Concerned Jewish Canadians in the 1980s and founder of the Jewish People's Liberation Organization, or JPLO, also in the 1980s. We're here in sunny Nablus in Palestine, and I want to talk to Abraham Weisfeld today about the history of Zionism, the tragedy of Zionism in the 20th century. So last time we talked, Dr. W Dr. Weisfeld, we talked about the opposition between socialist Zionism and Bundist socialism. But I wanted to ask you if there's anything in the early legacy of socialist Zionism worth saving. Did early socialist Zionism have at least an international impulse? In theory, though in practice it advocated a nationalism, did, it, did, did the theory behind it advocate internationalism? Well, there is a current of uh, socialist Zionism called uh, cultural Zionism. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a tendency that advocated a uh, binational Palestine or binational Israel. Which had a certain sense of recognition of the existence of the Palestinian people and uh, sought to accommodate the presence, the existence of the Palestinian people, together with that of the um, Israeli uh, Jewish population, and called for a binational uh, federation of sorts. But at the same time, they were supporting a Zionist state. So they had a contradiction between the Zionist nation state concept and a binational society concept. And uh, because of this contradiction, they ultimately failed. Uh, some of the founders, like Magnus, uh, were the uh, co-founders of the uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, which had an uh, internationalist or secular flavor to it. Uh, but otherwise, they uh, didn't achieve, uh, did not achieve very much, and um, only left behind, you know, perhaps the one word by nationalism. So the uh, the socialist Bundists were actually working towards the international struggle against capitalism, towards uh, betterment of humanity. But the, in the theory of the socialist Zionists, at least, did they connect their project in Palestine at all? with the hope of an international socialist or communist revolution, or was it purely uh, focused around the Jewish people and the, uh, the end of anti-Semitism and the strengthening of the Jewish nation? Well, they had a position that was uh, anti-Zionist for Jewish reasons, uh, not for the uh, Palestinian reasons. There wasn't very, very much a, a awareness of the existence of the Palestinian people at the time, neither by the Zionists nor the anti-Zionists, actually. And uh, the Jewish Bund, uh, which was the Jewish Workers' uh, Socialist Movement, that was uh, a faction within the uh, Russian Social Democratic Party, uh, comprised uh, 35,000 members in 1903, and uh, they were uh, struggling for the rights of the Jewish workers, who were a lower class to the working class in Poland and Russia. And they uh, also had a sense of uh, demanding political rights and for the collective uh, Jewish people as a whole, which uh, amounted to a civil rights movement, as in the uh, U.S. African American civil rights movement. However, they demanded collective rights, not merely individual uh, civil rights. Okay. And uh, this uh, sense of collective rights was encapsulated by the formulation national cultural autonomy, mm -hmm. which was a concept developed by the Bund, not at its founding in 1897, when it was founded on the basis of civil rights and workers' rights, but uh, later on in 1903 when they had to account for themselves in the uh, Russian Social Democratic Party where they were being accused of being um, separatists or segregationists. Mm. So in response they said, no, we're not uh, separatists or segregationists. We don't want to isolate the Jewish people from other peoples. 
we want to live together with other peoples in a sense of internationalism, but they wanted to have recon recognition of the plight of the Jewish people and the Jewish workers who were subjected to an additional degree of oppression, national oppression, which rendered the Jewish working class poorer than the regular Jewish, uh, Polish working class or Russian working class. So it required a national dimension and uh, national organizations in order to represent them because the regular organizations and the uh, regular uh, political system did not uh, take into consideration the rights of the Jewish people, either as people or as workers. So the Jewish national cultural autonomy represented th this concept and uh, it was uh, rejected at the time by both the uh, Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. Plekhanov tried to insult the Bund by calling uh, us uh, the uh, Zionists who had seasickness because we didn't want to leave Poland, but we wanted uh, national recognition nonetheless. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, national recognition or the, um, the identity of Jewish people as such was common to all of the four Jewish political tendencies at the time who were secular. There were the uh, Jewish Bund, then there was the uh, Zionist movement, then there was the Jewish Autonomous movement, which founded the World Jewish Congress. Which later became Zionist. Did it become Zionist or...? Not necessarily. Yeah. And then there were also the uh, fourth uh, political tendency, which is called territorialist. Mm. All these four political tendencies, which differed from one another, all recognize the nature of the Jewish national identity. That is, that there exists a Jewish nation, even though all the members of this nation had dual identities and also considered themselves to be Polish or Russian or whatever, or American, in addition to being Jewish. For Jewish people, there's no conflict between having a dual identity. You can be both Jewish and British, or Jewish and French, or Jewish and American. You know, there's no such uh, contradiction. There is a certain set of uh, political culture in the United States which considers that there is a contradiction between claiming national identity other than that of being an American. However, this is an illusion. It's a false identity. False consciousness, as it's called in uh, political theory. Now, the national cultural autonomy claimed by the Jewish Bund uh, was picked up as a concept by none other than the uh, Austrian um, political theorist uh, Otto Bauer, who was uh, Jewish Austrian, although he didn't consider himself to be Jewish, because he had uh, more so the uh, American conception that in order to uh, claim equal citizen rights within a given uh, nation state, you had to uh, stake your claim to be a member of that nation and only of that nation. So instead, Otto Bauer wrote a whole thesis about the matter, which I've read and integrated into my doctoral thesis. And in this thesis, he projects national cultural autonomy, which is a concept that he obtained from the Jewish Bund, and it applies it to the Hungarian population, who were part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire before the First World War. The um, empire that had um, a double eagle as a symbol and was ruled by the um, uh, Austrian um, monarch. And in order to accommodate the Hungarian population within this empire, in order to, in, in effect, preserve this empire, this social democratic political theorist projected a uh, constitutional provision for national cultural autonomy for the Hungarian population, mm. even though he rejected it for the Jewish population, which resided in Austria and Hungary. Why was it because the Jewish population wasn't in one territory like the Hungarians were? Precisely. Because he considered national identity to be um, linked with a, a territorial locale, which is, in effect, um, an economistic uh, position. Because if you have a certain population concentrated in a certain territory, then you have a certain economy associated with that particular national formation, which means, in effect, that you have a national bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. And the social democratic conception, uh, which accommodated itself to the nation-state concept, 
also accommodated itself to the existence of the national bourgeoisie, with whom which they considered themselves to uh, uh, be making an accommodation. They sought to make an accommodation mm -hmm. to regulate a capitalist economy in the interests of the working class. So is that why the you know the the Communist Manifesto and Marx's idea of the proletariat was one that inherently broke with territorial boundaries because yes it was an economistic position derived from historical materialism materialist in the sense of economist economism meaning that uh, they did an analysis from a purely economic point of view which may be a materialist but it certainly is not uh, political you know a political uh, analysis comprises much more than an economic analysis but you said so so whenever a people is defined in terms of territory that already implies the existence of a bourgeoisie precisely right? but so the proletariat then is by definition you know extra territorial it's it's an international uh, people that aren't bound to, to territory that's right because the proletariat is not tied to private property it's not tri tied to a private uh, piece of land is not tied to a, a private corporation which is situated in one locale okay notwithstanding the transnationals of today now the bourgeoisie is tied to a particular territory a particular economy because there it has authority it can regulate their own economy but they cannot do so in any other territory so the territory is a is a consequence of the nature of private property itself which is not the case for the working class so that's where the social democracy errs, because they um, are tied to a nation-state concept, which is in effect tied to a national bourgeoisie. So is that why Zionism was a bourgeoisie theory also? Because like above all, it sought for the Jews to have a territory and make a place in nation state. Yes, this was made uh, explicit by the Zionist theoretician in Russia called Ber Berkhov, mm -hmm. who uh, considered that the Jewish uh, people were abnormal because they had an um, an inverted pyramid, so to speak, in which the working class um, was uh, predominant uh, in the uh, population, and then there was a, uh, a rather um, emaciated, you know, uh, national bourgeoisie amongst the Jewish uh, people, uh, predominantly located in the um, financial sector, in, in a very lim limited number, with no particular uh, territorial um, uh, affiliation no uh, nation-state with whom that, uh, they were subordinate to, nor uh, responsible for. And therefore, uh, Ber Berkhov said that the only way in order to um, regulate the nature of the Jewish people was to put them into a context which is the same as any other European nation-state. That is, that there had to be created a nation-state for the Jewish people that would create a national bourgeoisie which could then be overthrown by the Jewish working class to make a socialist, you know, uh, country, which was completely contrary, you know, to the uh, to the initial intention, if that was, if that's uh, what the intention was in the first place. So we thought that the establishment of a state for the Jews in Palestine would create a bourgeoisie there, but then that bourgeoisie actually establishment of the state would be overthrown. Yes, you know, it's it's this theory of of a. Uh, uh, a historical um, uh, analysis which is called linear period periodization in which it is considered that the, there are historical epochs which must be it, uh, which must be passed through in order to create a successful socialist revolution according to Marx you had feudalism which passes through capitalism which then passes to socialism okay in order to get to socialism you have to go through capitalism according to Marx this was not the case in Russia. This was not the case in China. And that is why Trotsky, Bronstein, came to analyze the situation and recognized that you can have something which he called a permanent revolution based upon uneven and combined development, which jumps over any capitalist stage from a feudalistic economy because the national bourgeoisie is so weak that it becomes uh, an ally of imperialist powers or the previous feudal order obliterates itself from history as a result and uh, the only choice left to make an independent society in a national liberation struggle or in the pursuit of you know the liberation of the working class you are obliged to go into socialism immediately without passing through a capitalist stage so the early Zionists what did they have in common with the boon I mean both arose from the poor sectors of of Jewry and, and Poland and Russia. 
Ashkenazi Jewry and both, to some extent, dreamed of a, 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 a better world, at least for the Jews, if not for all humanity. Uh, I, I wouldn't say so. I would say that the Zionists arose from a middle class that sought to assimilate itself into uh, secular society, but found that they were unable to do so, that they were discriminated against, and they were not allowed to assimilate into the society as such. And so they sought to create a society within which they could have equal rights, and that was a society with a Jewish nation state. So they sought to recreate the Christian nation states of Europe in their own name, and uh, in pursuit of their own liberation, but that was merely the liberation of the uh, middle class elements, the professional elements, the national bourgeoisie which supported such a project, which um, dragged along a certain segment of the Jewish working class because they promised them heaven on earth. Oh, so it was really, so whereas the boon actually genuinely arose from the Jewish working class, Zionism actually arose from the bourgeoisie. From the middle class, first of all, then they, then they got the uh, attention of the Jewish bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. You know, because the initial affiliation, initial sort of, you know, pursuit, you know, of any national bourgeoisie, of course, is uh, wealth and, and not, you know, uh, not uh, their, uh, their own liberation until they realize that they are subject to uh, the same oppression as any other member of the Jewish community when the time comes. So they then uh, realize that they have to sort of develop a political program in order to protect themselves. To get their wealth, their wealth to, wasn't to make, ultimately for the better. To keep their wealth, yeah. that's right, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. the people like, I mean... Now, like, the similarity between Zionism and Bundism is the recognition of the national identity of the Jewish people, which the Marxists did not recognize. Mm -hmm. That's where the similarity does exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, but this similarity of the recognition of Jewish identity was shared by the Autonomists, which founded the World Jewish Congress, and the Canadian Jewish Congress, and the American Jewish Congress, etc., etc., and the Territorialists, who sought to achieve a Jewish territory, a Jewish homeland, <coughs> but not by displacing another people like the Zionists have done. Israel Zang Zangvil was one of the uh, spokespersons for the Territorialist movement, and he's the one who developed the slogan, uh, a land without a people for a people without a land. The Zionists stole that slogan and used it for Palestine, even though they knew that the Palestinians existed. But the Palestinians didn't have independence. They didn't have their own nation state. So by that definition, <coughs> they consider that the Palestinians <coughs> did not exist as a people. Mm. Oh, because they didn't. Yeah, because they were stuck with the nation state concept of the people. Because they didn't have their independence, yeah. So they weren't considered to be a people. Yeah, yeah. So who were the autonomous? And what, what were the territorial? What was their? Uh, so they they were they were alongside the Zionists and wanting some kind of territorial autonomy for the Jewish people at that time. No, they weren't really alongside the Zionists. They were uh, aside the, the the Zionists and and the other political tendencies. But they never got very far. There were various sort of you know initiatives. You know there was one even uh, territorialist who wanted to form a Jewish territory in North America. Oh, near really? Detroit. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. He wanted to call it um, Arafat or something like that. Arafat? Yeah, like yeah. Mount Arafat, uh, oh, oh, where okay. Noah landed. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. But there was a uh, Jewish territory established, you know, in the, <clears throat> in the Soviet Union, a Jewish Autonomous Republic of Virbajan. Oh, yeah? Yeah. When? That was established in 1926. And it still it, exists today? Yeah, it still exists today, but it's not, uh, it doesn't have a republic status anymore because it's... Uh, because it declined in importance. Mm. So it's in a Jewish autonomous region now, which um, has an, a national language of Yiddish, located near the Chinese border. Oh, really? Yeah. So is it heavily populated? What is it? Uh, no, it has one city. It has a newspaper in Yiddish. Oh. But uh, when the high-speed train from China goes north to Siberia, it will have uh, uh, a link to the world, which uh, will provide it with easy access, so that may uh, rejuvenate it as a, as a site. Oh, wow. So what were the, uh, who, uh, who was the autonomous group? What were they? Uh, they sought to, uh, to achieve a certain degree of political autonomy for the Jewish people so they could have a Jewish voice within the countries uh, in the diaspora that they were living in. So they formed the World Jewish Congress, uh, the, uh, you know, the national Jewish congresses of each country, which lobbied. It was like a lobbying organization on behalf of the Jewish community, mm. lobbying for civil rights, you know. But they didn't have a sense of... Um, of uh, they didn't have a program that extended, you know, to national cultural autonomy like the Bund did. Mm. 
So who who developed the concept of national cultural uh, autonomy? Oh, there there were various uh, Jewish theorists, you know, in the Bundes movement. Uh, uh, but it's difficult to say. I think it was developed, you know, in in order to present a program for adoption at the 1903 uh, Social Democratic Congress of the Russian Party. Mm. But um, because the Bund was expelled as the first order of business. Uh, they never got to present it, you know, for adoption, because they wanted to um, present a concept of a federation, a federated society, with recognition for the Jewish people as well as other nationalities. But both the um, Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, you know, had a nation-state concept, and they either bourgeois or proletarian, which uh, had a very centralized conception of what you know the, um, the revolutionary regime was going to be. And in effect, that's what they did. The Bolsheviks instituted, you know, a Bolshevik dictatorship of the proletariat, which uh, eventually destroyed the internal opposition in the Communist Party, <coughs> and then destroyed the external opposition uh, amongst the uh, the anarchists and uh, and uh, with uh, with uh, centralized state apparatus as such, in contradiction with the nature of civil society. They uh, eventually uh, destroyed the hope. Project and it dissolved, you know, in <coughs> 1989. It's getting a bit cold now. This is uh, winter time in uh, Palestine. During the day, it's like summer, and then as soon as the sun goes down behind the mountain over there, we get very cold. Well, should we go inside? Yes, let's take a break.